thank you very much. Joe, you'd like me to finish by 5 or before 5? Which? Take, take about an hour. I'll miss both. Yeah. OK, fine. <laughs> um, so um, the, the parameters of this talk are these here, uh, presented for fellow scientists, interested non-scientists, um, to promote interdisciplinary interaction in the campus research community, as well as with colleagues from other institutions and with the public. So it's absolutely impossible to do that in, in a talk. So it's destined to fail. <laughs> so um, expect to be disappointed at some level. But uh, my, my reading of this is that I will try to do this. So I'm going to give you a broad and hopefully accessible overview of modern research on the solar system and uh, modern research on exoplanets, so planetary systems around other stars. And I hope that's what you were expecting. Um, in case you fall asleep, as some of you might, during the next uh, hour approximately, here's a summary of what this talk will, will say at the end. Uh, the basic point is very simple. We are making dramatic advances in the last few decades towards understanding the formation and evolution of the solar system. It's driven by all sorts of new technology, spacecraft, telescopes on the ground, high-speed computers, and lots of people doing interesting work. And at the same time, it's become commonplace to uh, discover planets around other stars. So <coughs> the future, to me, looks pretty clear. We want to use the detailed knowledge we have of the solar system to understand planetary systems around other stars, about which we will never know that much by comparison with the solar system planets. And we want to use the planetary systems of other stars to set the solar system in its proper context. So in particular, we want to know, is the solar system freakish or is it typical? And questions of that kind can be answered only by looking at the diversity of planetary systems uh, wherever they may be. So I'll begin by talking very briefly about the solar system. This talk was much, much too long when I practiced earlier today. And so I cut out significant parts of it, including the solar system. But um, <laughs> not all of it. So I'll give you a quickie overview of the solar system. So it makes sense to consider the solar system divided into these three uh, domains. Um, three regions where the, the properties of the objects are, have something in common. So first of all, there's the domain of the terrestrial planets shown up there. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and the asteroids probably should be included too. Um, these bodies, we think, formed by binary accretion, so basically bits of dust stick together to make bigger bits of dust, which stick together to make grains of sand, which stick together to make uh, pebbles, which stick together to make boulders, which stick together to make asteroids, which stick together to make embryos which stick together to make the planets. And the whole business, in the case of the Earth, took something like 50 million or 100 million years for the Earth uh, to reach its final mass. <clears throat> so we know a lot about terrestrial planets because we live on one. We love terrestrial planets, especially our one. Uh, but we know um, a great deal about all of them because they're nearby and we send spacecraft there and we have pretty detailed ideas about how they formed. Compared to the other domains, the gas giants, um, are the giant planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, <coughs> they formed by a different process, and we're not completely sure how they formed. Um, they're different from the terrestrial planets in that they're not rock metal dominated, they're gas dominated. Um, in particular, Jupiter and Saturn um, are very massive, and they're mostly composed of hydrogen and helium, so they're quite different from the terrestrial planets, and much more like the Sun in their composition. And Uranus and Neptune are a little different. They belong in a separate box called the ice giants. They're composed of, we think, molecules like water and methane and ammonia and so on, and rocks mixed in with uh, much less hydrogen and helium than we see in the gas giant planets. And then the domain that's really opened up in the last few decades is the one at the bottom, the domain of the comets. So the comets are essentially um, icy bodies, small planetesimals, and, and, and slightly larger bodies that grew um, in the, the protoplanetary disk of the sun at distances where water was stable in its solid form. So they formed beyond this thing that's called the snow line, like the snow line going up a mountain. Outside the snow line, water is stable as a solid. Inside, it's um, a gas. It's a vapor. And the comets fit into these two uh, broad reservoirs, the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt. I'll say a little bit about those in just a moment. So here's the only table of numbers, and we don't need to even look at all of them. The point is just to note, here is, uh, here's mass, here's radius in units of the Earth's mass and the Earth's radius. Here's density, 
And this is luminosity. We probably won't talk about that too much. So the sun is really big. Um, it's uh, <coughs> uh, in mass, it's um, almost a million times the mass of the Earth. It's 300,000 times the mass of the Earth. In linear scale, it's about 100 times the size of the Earth. We'll remember those numbers for later when we compare uh, stars and planets. The terrestrial planets all have about the same density. It's about five times the density of water, consistent with being a mixture of rock and metal. Um, the gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, are very massive compared to the Earth. It's 315 Earth masses of stuff in Jupiter. Most of that is hydrogen and helium, 95 masses for Saturn. And they're about 10 times bigger than the Earth. Remember that, too, for later on. And then the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, are 15 or 16 times the Earth's mass and about four times the diameter um, of the Earth. So we have these fairly distinct uh, bodies. All the mass in the solar system essentially is in the Sun. All the mass that's not in the Sun is in Jupiter. So the solar system consists to first order of the Sun and Jupiter and then little bits of other stuff. But uh, significantly, information content in the solar system is not very closely tied to the mass of the body. So it turns out we can learn a tremendous amount by studying objects like comets, which individually are tiny, just a kilometer or a mile across, and which have basically no mass compared to the things in this table. Uh, they can carry a huge amount of uh, scientific information. So I want to... I don't care, <laughs> since I already said I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> Let's talk about the Kuiper Belt and not about typos. Here is um, a diagram showing uh, the distribution of objects in the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt, um, the first object in the Kuiper Belt is um, Pluto, was misclassified as a planet. We realized following the discovery of the second one in 1992 that there is, in fact, uh, a ring of such bodies beyond Neptune. So this is a donut-shaped ring of comets uh, located beyond the planet Neptune. Neptune is 30 AUs from the Sun. So in this diagram, which shows semi-major axis distance from the Sun versus orbital eccentricity, um, Neptune is here with this N. This, this basically means uh, the shape of the orbit. Zero is a circle. Uh, 0.8 is an elongated egg-shaped uh, ellip elliptical orbit. <coughs> so Neptune is here. Here's 100 AU over there. All you need to gather from this plot, I think, is that the distribution of Kuiper Belt objects in this uh, semi-major axis eccentricity plane is highly non-random. It's not just a sprinkling of points all over. They're clustered in various places. And I'll mention a few of the um, relevant things that will come back and haunt us later in this talk. So first of all, there's this broad band of objects that goes up um, diagonally across the diagram between these two black uh, lines. These are objects which we believe are being scattered by Neptune on long time scales because they all have a perihelion uh, closest approach to the sun, which is near Neptune. So they can be um, uh, affected strongly by Neptune's gravity. Um, second of all, there are some objects, but not very many, like these ones here, marked detached, um, which do not have a perihelion near Neptune's orbit. So this line shows Neptune's perihelion from here to here is about 20 astronomical units. This object never gets near Neptune, so it was emplaced by something else, not by Neptune. And we'll see in a moment, we think uh, one possible explanation is uh, an ancient passing star, although there are many other uh, possibilities for that. Also, you see that there are objects in vertical lines. These are bodies trapped in mean motion resonances with Neptune. That basically means that the ratio of their orbit period around the sun to Neptune's orbit period around the sun is the ratio of small, num small integers, like 3 and 2 and 1 and 2 and things like that. So these are the 3, three to 2 resonant Kuiper Belt objects. The most famous one is right there. That's Pluto. Um, and the significance of the resonance is that it conveys dynamical stability to objects in those resonances. And then lastly, <coughs> the red things are what we originally thought the Kuiper Belt would be like. We thought it would be a relatively thin um, pancake instead of a fat donut-shaped distribution of bodies. Um, so it's a little puffed up, more than we expected. But most surprisingly, it has this very sharp outer edge. There are no red dots beyond here. The, it ends basically at 50 AU, close to the 2 to 1 mean motion resonance with Neptune, for reasons which are not really understood. 
uh, but which probably uh, are related again to external perturbations. So that's the Kuiper belt. Measurements of the Kuiper belt have shown us that the total mass of all the stuff we can see is actually quite small. It's only a tenth of an Earth mass. So it's rather puny. There's lots of objects. There are 1,500 known. There are um, 70,000 Kuiper belt objects bigger than 100 kilometers. There are probably a billion Kuiper belt objects bigger than a kilometer, so bigger than, you know, like a comet nucleus. But their combined mass is um, on the order of a tenth of an Earth mass. And the significance of that is that they're spread over a huge volume of space in the solar system. So their density is very, very low. And that means that while they collide, collisions are extremely infrequent. And that means that the Kuiper Belt objects did not grow <coughs> in their present location with this initial mass. Their, their growth time is longer than the age of the solar system. If you just assume that the Kuiper Belt objects grow by collisions, by binary accretion, um, then the time scale for growth is bigger than, actually is bigger than the age of the sun. It's bigger than uh, five billion years. So people believe, and I believe, that that's because the Kuiper Belt is a remnant, that it was originally a much more massive structure, and that it's been whittled away by something or other down to a, a, a vague shadow of its initial self. And the best estimates are that it had to be a hundred or a thousand times more massive in the beginning than it is now. So there were ten, tens of Earth masses of stuff in the Kuiper Belt in the beginning, uh, we believe, in order for these bodies to grow on any reasonable time scale. That's one thing. I already mentioned the mean motion resonances. It's a big surprise. These were not expected. It's a big surprise that these are strongly populated, heavily populated regions in the Kuiper Belt. And the only model for populating the resonances that's uh, really been proposed and uh, has survived is one in which Neptune migrates. The planet orbit expands with time. And the mean motion resonances of the planet are swept through the Kuiper belt and pick up objects as they go by. <coughs> so the uh, populated mean motion resonances provide evidence for past planetary migration in the solar system. And let's just think about that a little bit. If you had a planetary system with just the Sun and Neptune and one other body, one Kuiper Belt object, Neptune is moving in a roughly circular path. Suppose Neptune scatters the, the, the Kuiper Belt object and launches it off to the interstellar media, it just ejects it from the solar system. So uh, the body carries away its own mass. Um, it has some speed, so it carries away some energy, and it carries away some angular momentum. So where does it get that angular momentum? angular momentum? It gets it from Neptune's orbit. So in a one-planet system, Neptune's orbit would shrink as a result of ejecting bodies out to the interstellar medium. But we believe that the um, orbit of Neptune expanded. Why would that be? Most likely, it's because, um, as was pointed out by these people, uh, very, very early on, these people were completely ignored, partly because they were just ahead of their time, partly because this guy was from South America and people figured, ah, we don't care what he says. Um, but, but they were right. It's a multi-planet system. And so uh, Neptune can scatter Kuiper Belt objects in and out, but it can send some to Uranus. Uranus can scatter them in and out, but it can send some to Saturn. Saturn can do the same, and it will send some to Jupiter. And Jupiter is the big guy in the solar system. And Jupiter is responsible for launching the bodies out to the interstellar medium. So the ultimate source of energy and angular momentum in the solar system is Jupiter's orbit. And the belief is that Jupiter's orbit shrank, but not by much, because Jupiter is so massive. And the orbits of Saturn and Uranus and Neptune expanded. And this all happened in the early phases when the solar system was still full of um, uh, primitive objects, when the planets were still not at quite their final masses, were still building up. So in the first few million, maybe 10 million years of the solar system <coughs> in, the, in the standard view. OK, so people have um, looked at this in some detail and taken the evidence for migration that comes from the Kuiper belt with the importance of resonances and asked the question, what would happen to the solar system if planet migration caused planets 
to get into mean motion resonances. So what happens if, for example, Jupiter gets into a mean motion resonance with Saturn? Well, um, they're not in mean motion resonance now. So the orbit period of Saturn is uh, 29 years. The orbit period of uh, Jupiter is 12. 29 divided by 12 is not quite 2.5, but it's near there. Uh, so what if it was exactly 2.5? So that's explored in a model called the Nice model from people in France. And I'll just show one of the simulations from their model that represents really the state of the art thinking for the solar system. So here are the planets. Here's their initial model. So they start with the planets here, 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 and here. Outside the planets, they put a Kuiper belt. And this line of bodies represents a whole bunch of dots. The Kuiper belt is assumed to be 30 Earth masses of stuff. Why 30 Earth masses? Well, because that's what they need to make this work well. And we're going to watch this thing evolve. This, again, is eccentricity. This is distance from the sun until uh, Jupiter and Saturn enter mean motion resonance. And then it'll be fairly clear what happens then. <coughs> so first of all, the outermost planet immediately launches this arc, which looks very much like the arc of scattered Kuiper Belt objects that we saw in the actual distribution. We also see this region here, which looks a bit like the classical Kuiper belt. And we see vertical structures that become more or less strong uh, with time that resemble the resonant structures that we see in the real distribution of Kuiper belt objects. So, some, so far, everything looks good. These flashing objects are Kuiper belt objects that have been pushed into a place where they can cross the orbits of planets. And they're being lost immediately. They flash because they just disappear from the system. The planets are jumping because every time they eject a Kuiper Belt object, they recoil in the opposite direction. So that's the jumpy motion of the planets. And all the time, these bodies are radially moving slowly towards this line when Saturn goes into a mean motion resonance. When that happens, the system changes in a dramatic way like that. And the reason is hard to see on a first look, and I don't have time to play this many, many times. But the basic reason is that this planet which we would call Neptune, um, uh, originally was over here in their model and was thrown out by interactions with the other planets uh, into the Kuiper belt. And it's like throwing a brick into a hornet's nest. The hornets don't like that. They fly out of the nest, they buzz around, and off they go. So these objects are launched into eccentric orbits, which are planet crossing. And then the planet crossing bodies are ejected from the system or thrown into the sun, or maybe they hit a planet. So this is a big deal in the solar system, because before this, models of the solar system were, were, the polite word would be sedate. So the planets moved in circles around the sun. They have little gravitational pulls on each other, but nothing much happens. So this is a big change. This is a chaotic, it's the reintroduction of, of chaotic, chaotic motion into the solar system due to a resonance between the two most massive things in the solar system, which are not the sun. So Jupiter and Saturn. <coughs> They set up this vibration that shakes everything loose from the Kuiper belt. <coughs> so that, we think, is one way to lose 99% or 99% of the mass from the Kuiper belt. We just shake the hell out of it, and off it goes uh, into the interstellar medium. We have other evidence from the solar system that um, suggests that the sun didn't form alone. So we observe. Um, People who study meteorites, of whom there are many, many uh, world experts at UCLA, uh, have noticed that there are the decay products from very short-lived radioactive elements, uh, notably aluminum-26, but iron-60 is even more important in some ways, because it has to be produced a very short time before incorporation in the meteorites by the explosion of a supernova. So these very short-lived radioactive elements <coughs> were created by a star that was quite massive, which exploded near the sun about the time when the planets were forming. Now, if we look around the solar system now, we don't find any massive stars about to go supernova, which is a good thing. Um, and so this suggests that the environment for the formation of the planetary system was different from what we uh, experience now, and suggests, in fact, that the sun formed in a cluster of stars, which is not that surprising, because if you look in the background, that's the Pleiades. I mean, you look in the sky, and you see star clusters, and you see young stars in clusters. But here's evidence that the solar system really formed in this way. The, there are various other arguments which I'll skip over. The edge in the Kuiper belt at 50 AU can be interpreted as a tidal truncation 
by a star of solar mass passing about 200, 250 AUs from the sun. Again, that won't happen in the modern uh, uh, universe, the modern solar system, uh, but it might have happened when the sun was a member of a dense cluster. Uh, and likewise, the existence of the detached Kuiper Belt objects um, <coughs> suggests that some massive body passed near the sun, uh, probably within 400 astronomical units at some early time. So, um, from these kinds of observations, there's a very nice recent review paper by Fred Adams in which these things are all combined to estimate that the sun formed in a cluster containing about 4,000 stars. And what the thing that's controlled by the dynamical parameters, the erosion of the Kuiper belt and so on, is really the product of the number density with the amount of time uh, that the cluster held together. So that product is 80,000 in these horrible units um, stars per cubic parsec times millions of years. So you can pick any combination you like. 4,000 stars in one cubic parsec for 20 million years gives you 80,000, or 4,000 stars in 10 cubic parsecs for 200 million years gives you 80,000, and so on. Uh, but basically, these are the constraints we have on the birth cluster of the sun. So we probably did not form in splendid isolation. Now, astronomers are very interested in star formation. They've been studying this since, you know, forever. <coughs> And the basic idea um, was actually explained by um, this old English gentleman, uh, James Jeans, about 100 years ago, sl slightly more than 100 years ago. And he said, he gave a thought experiment like this. If you take a balloon and squeeze the balloon, what you do is you, uh, you decrease the volume of the balloon, so you increase the internal pressure of the balloon. When you let go, the balloon will bounce back to its initial size. If you take a much bigger balloon, and squeeze it, it'll get smaller, the pressure inside will go up. When you let go, it'll bounce back to its initial size. If you keep doing that for larger and larger balloons, you reach a critical size above which the balloon never springs back. <coughs> and that's because if you go big enough, the mass of the material in the balloon has enough gravity to take control. So you squeeze it a little bit, you densify it a little bit, the gravity becomes strong enough to continue the collapse even against the opposing influence of the internal gas pressure. So that's called Jean's mass. It depends on the temperature and the density. And it's the basis for the instability of the interstellar medium. So we think the gas between the stars can attain this Jean's mass and collapse on itself under its own gravity. And people with computers have simulated this um, in many, many uh, spectacular ways. So I just found one nice model that I would like to show you. This is a 500 solar mass um, blob of gas <coughs> with an impressed velocity field from um, supersonic turbulence that's collapsing under its own gravity. So regions that are initially a little bit dense become denser because of gravity. This thing divides up into filaments and blobs. We zoom in to look at those uh, in more detail. <coughs> so here's um, a little center of star formation activity. We begin to see stars uh, forming. They're being ejected because they swing past each other, and they slingshot accelerate each other out. So here's a, a center of star formation that's ejecting stars. Many of these will leave the system and go off and become free-floating stars uh, in the plane of the galaxy. Here's another center of star formation that's taken over. And so what's developing is one of the star clusters, probably like the one in which um, our sun formed. So this just gives you some perspective on the origin of the sun and the place in which the planets formed around one of these stars in a cluster like this. So this is a numerical modeling person, uh, Matthew Bate. That means he's interested in zooming, so you can zoom out and you can rotate this thing. He's gonna do you know, all the degrees of freedom you see this there. There's the rotation, just to show you that he can do that. Okay, very nice. <laughs> Here's another model. <laughs> uh, this is a zoom, and so it shows a few of the condensed um, objects that uh, appeared near the center of that cluster in this collapsing uh, model. And just to show you the, eject, the star formation process, the fact that they're spinning uh, very fast is important. This guy is spinning. It appears to be flickering if you're at the back of the room. And here's a star. And then the stars are slingshot accelerated. Some fall back. Some are ejected. OK, he does a translation because he can. And then we see this, this process continues. So it's very spectacular. We see it in the sky, but we only see a snapshot, of course, because we don't live for uh, a million years. This is roughly a million-year integration. The free-fall time for the cloud 
uh, which just depends on the density, is uh, in this case about 0.2 of a million years. And then he's doing the rotation again because he can. So that's wonderful. That's a very simplistic calculation. Many of these important uh, parameters of the collapse are ignored in this calculation, but there you go. Now I have a model. I wonder if it's possible to dim the lights a little bit in this room so we can see this next movie, which is quite a dark one. <coughs> Let's see if it's going to work. Nope, didn't work. Too bad. Well, it, was it working? Let's try it again. It's so dark, I can't tell if it's working. OK, here it goes. Good. Uh, so this is um, uh, kind of the Hollywood version of the same thing. So these are stars turning on in a cluster, just to set the scene for you. Um, these are stars that are appearing in the, in the Merck. The opacity of the cloud is due to dust, um, submicron dust particles distributed through the gas cloud and mixed with it. This is the kind of thing that we would see from a telescope. This is like um, Orion. This is probably a million-year-old uh, star formation region with a few thousand stars in it. We zoom in to one uh, forming star, which has <clears throat> a disk. The star is actually not clearly visible. It's here. There's a disk. There's a jet of material. This is called a herbig haro jet that's shot out from the star. Its practical function for the disk is to remove angular momentum uh, and mass from the disk. And the end result is that the star uh, forms, fusion begins, it turns on, and is surrounded by an admittedly very faint disk in which planets form. So that's kind of the perspective. We have interesting angles, interesting um, views on this process from the solar system that seem to be fitting in pretty well with what we see just through astronomical observations of other stars. Let me go through, and thanks for turning the lights down. If you want to turn them up, it's a, a good time to do that now. The uh, planet detection methods are probably worth a mention since they, they really determine what we can see. Basically, there are several. I'll talk mostly about Doppler, transit, and direct there's another one that uh, may be very important in the future called microlensing. So qualitatively, you understand this, I think. Um, the planet uh, pulls on the star, so they orbit around the center of mass. In the case of the Jupiter Sun system, the center of mass is actually about on the surface of the Sun. It's roughly on the photosphere. So you can imagine the Sun moving in a circle with a period of 12 years corresponding to the 12-year period of Jupiter. If we looked at the sun from a great distance, we would see the sun moving on this small circle. And if we measured its line of sight velocity using the Doppler technique, we would see it blue shifted and red shifted periodically with a 12 year cycle. So a measurement of speed versus time would look like this. Something like a sine curve, but this orbit is slightly eccentric and so it's not quite a perfect sine curve. <coughs> we could then use the velocity measurement to estimate the mass of the perturba. If we know what the star is, we can estimate the mass of the perturba, the planet. And that's what people do. It's subject to a major uncertainty, which is we don't know when we observe um, uh, a star, we don't know that we're observing from the plane of the planet's orbit. In fact, in general, we're not. So there's a projection factor, which is usually not known. And the net result is that masses derived from Doppler measurements are limits to the mass. So if we think the mass is, you know, 10 Jupiter masses, it's really 10 Jupiter masses or more, depending on the unknown inclination. So this method, the Doppler method, basically works best for stars which are small. Low mass stars can be pulled around more easily than high mass stars. It works best for uh, planets which are in close orbits uh, because the, the, the tug on the, on the star is stronger. And it works best for planets which have a large mass. So it's really good at detecting massive planets around puny stars uh, orbiting in tiny orbits. So it's highly biased. We also can hope to see planets cross the disks of their stars. So this is the transit method. <coughs> and when that happens, the brightness of the star will dip down a little bit. And the fading is just proportional to the area of the planet divided by the area of the star. So a typical solar mass main sequence star like the sun is about a million kilometers across. The Earth, I said earlier, is about 1% um, of the diameter of the sun. That means that the Earth crossing in front of the sun would cause the sun to get fainter by about one part in 10,000. 
So this measurement is too hard to do for Earth-sized planets from the surface of the Earth because of twinkling of starlight. But it can be done from space, and there's a spacecraft called Kepler that's up there now doing exactly this measurement. It's easy to find Jupiters this way because a Jupiter is about as big as I've drawn it. A Jupiter is a tenth the size of the star. It will cause the light from the star to drop by a factor of, um, by about 10%, uh, sorry, 1%. And that's what we see. So here's real data. This is for a Saturn-sized planet dimming the light from its star. And we have many of those. And then the most obvious one is direct imaging. Why not just go out and take a picture of a planet? Well, the reason is it's not that easy. So if you went outside the solar system and tried to take a picture of the Earth next to the sun, you would notice that the Earth in reflected light is 10 to the power of 10 times fainter than the sun. So extremely faint. The contrast ratio is huge and devastating, especially so when you remember that the radius of the Earth's orbit seen from only a parsec away is one arc second. So you have to see this enormously um, faint body right next to an enormously bright body. And the technology for that is emerging. It's still a very hard measurement. So we have a few cases. There's one published by Callas et al. Um, a couple of years ago. This is Fomalhaut, a star here with a, uh, a disk of dust uh, and apparently a planet in orbit around it. And then there's this star found by this group, uh, which includes a lot of UCLA people, Ben Zuckerman and uh, uh, some others. Uh, three, star, three planets, excuse me, in orbit around one star. This one, this one, and this one. And it doesn't look very impressive, perhaps, but <clears throat> successive images show the motions of the planets clearly. So there's no doubt that these are in orbit uh, around the star. So imaging works, but it doesn't work for many planets yet. One trick to improve the contrast is to catch the planets when they're young, because when they're young, they're hot and they glow. And when they glow, then their contrast ratio relative to the star is improved. So that uh, brings me to this figure, which shows basically the brightness of a planet or an object as a function of its age and as a function of its mass. And it allows me to tell you what's the difference between a star and a planet. So stars start out up here. Here's a 0.2 mass, 0.2 solar mass star. Starts out luminous, uh, cools down, but stabilizes after 100 million years or so. Uh, to a constant luminosity corresponding to settling onto the main sequence where it's burning hydrogen in steady state to keep itself glowing. Planets don't have fusion as a possible energy source. They don't have high enough central pressures or temperatures to, to allow fusion to occur. And so basically they can never reach this steady state. They just get colder and less luminous with time. So the planets just fade. And in between are these hybrid objects, the brown dwarfs, that can sustain a fusion of deuterium for a little while, uh, but then ultimately fade themselves. So the stars, brown dwarfs, and planets. The dividing line is that planets <coughs> more than about 13 Jupiter masses uh, are called brown dwarfs, and uh, brown dwarfs more than about 80 Jupiter masses are stars. They're heavy enough to uh, support fusion. So there's that um, Arthur C. Clarke uh, book and movie in which the claim is made that Jupiter is close to being uh, a star. Well, it's not. You know, it'd have to be 80 times more massive than it is to be a star. Jupiter is nowhere near being able to sustain fusion um, of any sort. Okay, so here are the planets. Uh, these are the planets as, as of the early part of this year, shown as a function of distance from the star, and here's the mass of the planet. And again, the main thing you should uh, notice from this plot is that the planets are not randomly distributed all over the place. They're quite clustered. That's one thing. The second thing is that the planets of the solar system, so have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, shown with red letters, occupy a different piece of real estate on this plot from the other planets. <coughs> and so your first conclusion might be, well, you know, that means the solar system is a freak. It's totally different from the other systems in terms of this distance mass plot. But of course, the effects of observational selection are strong. So um, this cluster of bodies up here uh, is determined by um, the radial velocity technique. Distance from the star is about 1 AU, corresponding to orbit periods of a year or so. That's what you can measure if you've been doing velocity measurements for a few years. You need to see the speed go up and down and up and down for a few orbits before you're sure you have a planet. 
So by definition, these planets um, are, are pref preferred uh, products of the uh, Doppler planet finding method. Down here, we don't have any extrasolar planets. The reason is they're too small. We're not sensitive to low mass planets. So we're basically not good at detecting long period planets out here or low mass planets. Um, and that's responsible for most of the clustering on this diagram. These objects, which are Jupiter mass planets at tiny distances from their stars, were some of the first planets found in a big way in recent times. And this all happened in the last 15 years. They're called hot Jupiters. And a lot of work has been done on hot Jupiters. People are, people are wondering how could they exist? Why are they there? Why are these hot Jupiters, whereas our Jupiter at 5 AU is a cold Jupiter? What's the difference between those? And so there are various models and um, suggestions for the origin of hot Jupiters, and I thought I'd just touch on one or two. So the idea is that <coughs> the planets formed in this disk. In the beginning, before the gas had been lost from the disk, something that happened in the first few million, maybe 10 million years, the disk is very massive. And interactions between the planet and the disk, gravitational interactions, set up waves. And the waves can be very important for the dynamics of the planet and for the formation of the planet. So here's a model of a disk. Star is in the middle. The disk is rotating like that. Here's a planet that's forming. And these are ribbons of material streaming uh, into the planet under gravity, but distorted by the rotation of the planet around the star. So think of a boat going across a lake. If the boat is very small and very slow, it doesn't make a big wave on the surface. But if, if the boat is uh, large and fast, it makes a wave on the surface. Same thing with the planet cruising through this disk. Let me just try that one more time. The planet excites a wave, and the wave is so big that the wave um, exerts a back pull on the planet. There's a, a torque exerted on the planet uh, by the material in the disk. And because the disk is asymmetric, the orbit period is shorter inside the planet than outside, and there's more uh, mass per unit area inside the planet than, than outside. Um, the, the net effect is a migration of the planet uh, inwards. The torque drags the planet down. So that's shown in the right-hand simulation. <coughs> which is fixed in the frame rotating with the planet. So the planet's not rotating, but it is moving in. And notice the time scale. It's 100 orbits. An orbit is you know, 10 years or something. It's short. So it's a few thousand years. It's very, very short time. Short even compared to the formation time for planets in many of our models. So people have pointed at this kind of planet migration in a massive disk uh, as being a way to get hot Jupiters. You form Jupiter out at large distances, and then it drifts in under uh, these uh, torques in towards the star. And in fact, there's probably a succession of planets that fall into the star and are never seen because they're gone. They've disappeared. And we just see the ones that didn't hit the star before the disk dissipated. That's the idea. So there's a Hollywood movie, of course, that goes with that. Um, here is the disk. Here is the sun. Here is the planet. And here's a streamer of material going into the planet. We're going to rotate around and zoom in to this forming planet. <coughs> this is a giant planet. It's more, in this case, it's more than 100 Earth masses. We know that because it's opened up a large gap in the disk surrounding it. Um, we see the waves go out and in in this disk. You can imagine that in a real system with many planets, this would be a very complicated disk structure with lots of ripples and waves and interference uh, and so on. Um, we're going to go um, in to look at this planet forming. We're going to see the streamers of material making the planet grow. And we'll see that the planet itself is surrounded by an accretion disk. And the accretion disk is uh, both the way in which mass gets into the planet and also the place where the satellites of the planet grow. So the Galilean satellites, the four big satellites of Jupiter, grew in this disk in here. It's dark because it's full of dust. And it's hard to see through from some angles. Here's the disk. Here's the planet in the center. Here are spirals of material going in. It appears to flicker in a moment because of rapid rotation in the center. It's bright because it's very dense. The planet is growing. This is a huge body. It's 100 or more Earth masses by now. 
And so this is the circumplanetary disk, which is an analog of the circumsolar disk for the accretion of planets, uh, but, but satellites grow in that disk. We just pass through the midplane of the disk, and then we're going to zoom out uh, perpendicular to the disk on the other side, and then see where this sits in this funny-looking gap in the circumstellar disk around the star. So that's all wonderful, right? And we're all trained to watch TV from a very young age. We love the movies. And if it's on a screen, it must be real, right? So apparently not. So convincing though that might have been, we have recent measurements that show that it's probably not what happened. The measurements come from this obscure technique called the Rossiter effect. So let me try to explain this. <coughs> if you look at a star uh, from down here, say, and the star is rotating, and the axis of the star is sticking perpendicular out of the screen, this side of the star is coming towards you, so light from this star is blue shifted, and this side of the star is going away from you, so that side is red shifted. If a planet comes across this way, so the star is rotating like that, if this planet is rotating in the same sense, it will first cover up the blue side of the star and then cover up the red side. And so the spectrum line from the star will show um, a hole, basically a deviation in the blue side that will then propagate over to the red side. On the other hand, if the planet goes around the other way, so the star is rotating like that, but the planet's rotating like that, then first of all, the red side will be covered up. So there'll be a dent in the red side of the spectrum line profile. And then that will propagate over to the blue side of the line. And so the sense of the distortion of the spectrum line will be the opposite. So it's a bit more complicated than that. But the bottom line is you can determine uh, with some accuracy the inclination of the orbit of a planet crossing the disk of a star from careful measurements of the shape of the spectrum line, usually using the world's biggest telescopes to get the best signal to noise. And the surprise is that in the last few years, a significant fraction of the stars for which this measurement um, has been possible um, are retrograde. They go around backwards relative to the star. So that's no good. I mean, it's good because it's real. But it's no good in terms of the migration model we just showed, because migration only works while the planet is strongly interacting with the disk, which means it must have the same uh, inclination as the disk. Uh, and it can't work if the planet is kicked up in some perpendicular or even backwards orbit. So the Rossiter effect applied to a sample of about 30 stars suggests that planet migration of the kind we showed is certainly not the whole picture and may not be the picture at all. Instead, uh, people are beginning to look to other possibilities. So one possibility is the planets um, can scatter from each other. So planets in a planetary system maybe begin in a disk because you need the density of the disk to form in the first place, but can become strongly gravitationally interacting and then can deflect each other onto wild and crazy orbits, in some cases perhaps even retrograde ones. That's a possibility. Uh, there's a thing called a Kozai resonance in which the uh, eccentricity and the inclination of an orbit acted upon by an ex external perturba are coupled so that um, if the uh, eccentric eccentricity is pumped up, the inclination goes up, and, and vice versa. So this kind of coupling, dynamical coupling, conceivably might explain some of the observed high inclination planets. And there's even the idea that we get from the initial model of cloud collapse by Matthew Bate, that maybe the disk of material from which planets form um, doesn't have to have the same orientation um, around the star as the initial material from which the star formed. Because you saw that the cloud collapsing was very um, disorderly, very tur turbulent, very twisted. Maybe the last bits of mass that come in to make the disk around the star just have a different sense of spin uh, compared to the uh, average sense of spin of the star. So that's being looked at too. But the thing that people have been talking about for the last decade, migration in massive disks, does not fit the data. So that's really an interesting thing and a step forward. Here's a model by Sean Raymond <coughs> showing three giant planets in a planetary system with a Kuiper belt and some terrestrial planets growing over here. And it looks OK for a while. The planets are jumping around. They're interacting slowly. But they are drifting towards yet another of these, these mean motion interactions. And when they do that, 
Okay, he slows the movie down so you can see what happens. One body is ejected to the outer regions, and then it's gone, and then the other body is ejected too. So this is a, one example of planet-planet interactions between giant planets around a star that leads to the ejection of planets from the control of the star. So planets can be ejected off into the interstellar medium. We can have free-floating planets off between the stars. No, no strong source of radiation for them. They'd be pretty miserable places to live, a little bit like uh, Boston in the wintertime. Uh, uh, but they could, be, uh, they could exist in large numbers. So the only constraint we have on the existence of interstellar planets comes from gravitational microlensing, where you look at stars and hope to see a star briefly magnified by the passing of a gravitational lens from a planet in front of the star. And that constraint says that there are not more than about three or four interstellar Jupiters per star. Well, you know, there's 100 billion stars in the galaxy, so there could be many hundreds of billions of free-floating Jupiters in the galaxy, and we wouldn't know. These things would have been lost from uh, planetary systems a long time ago by uh, these planet-planet interactions. Another conclusion from Raymond is that um, in systems where the interactions between planets are very strong, strong enough to eject giant planets uh, from the control of the star, everything else is destroyed too. So the terrestrial planet regions uh, tend to be decimated. The Kuiper belts in the outer regions tend to be decimated as well. The whole system ends up as a star, one or a few planets, and it's otherwise relatively clean. Turn that upside down, that means that when you see a star which is dusty, and we see many examples of these stars in the nearby environment. And again, UCLA has a lot of expertise, uh, Mike Jura, Ben Zuckerman, in studying these things. That is probably, if this is right, an indicator that those systems could have retained uh, terrestrial planets, yeah? because they haven't been decimated by these strong giant planet-planet interactions. So that's a, a pointer to the, the future. Let me just say a few words about uh, the sizes of extraterrestrial planets. So here's another uh, thought experiment to explain what's going on here. Uh, I'll just do the thought experiment. <coughs> so imagine that you get some rocks and you pile them together. And the pile of rocks just gets bigger and bigger. And as you pile more rocks on, you measure the mass and the radius of the pile of rocks. So at first, the density remains the same. You just add more rocks, and the density of the rocks is unchanged. So the radius goes up as the cube root of the mass, right? Because mass is proportional to radius cubed. If you keep doing that, and you get up to a fairly large size, then you add more rocks to the pile, and gravity causes this rock pile to self-compress in the middle, so it gets a little bit denser. So the radius doesn't increase quite so fast as it did uh, earlier on when the mass was low. And so the radius goes with the uh, mass to a power less than one-third. So if you keep doing that, you add more and more material, you eventually find yourself in a state where the radius doesn't grow at all. So you add material, and the object doesn't get any bigger. And the reason is that the object self-compressed enough to take up the extra material that you added. Okay? So why stop there? Why not add more material? What happens if you keep going and keep going? Well, in fact, the object will get smaller as you add more mass. Okay? So that's actually what happens. We see that. There's a diagram that qualitatively is like that one. So here's, this, here's what I just talked about. This is radius proportional to the cube of the mass. Here's radius independent of the mass. Over here is radius proportional to mass to the minus one third. And then something bad happens over there because you're going back down to zero ra uh, radius. So you add enough mass and the thing will disappear. <laughs> so. We have names for these things in various places on this diagram. Over here, we call them rocks or asteroids. Over here, where the compressibility is small but measurable, those are the terrestrial planets. So the Earth is a little bit denser than it would be if it didn't have gravity. In this region, we have the giant planets. <coughs> so Jupiter, <laughs> Jupiter and Saturn have basically the same size, but they're different in mass by a factor of three. So they definitely fall into this region here. Over here are the brown dwarfs and the white dwarfs. These are dead, degenerate stars. And then over here, nominally at least, is this thing, the Chandra Sekhar limit, um, uh, above which you cannot have uh, a big degenerate body because something nasty happens to it. So that's the background to how big uh, 
planets should be very qualitatively done. What are they actually like? Well, they're like that. So here are measurements of the sizes of planets, primarily from transit measurements, OK? Because transit measurement gives you the size directly just by telling you what fraction of the photosphere of the star is blocked out. Here's the mass um, of the planet uh, from the Doppler technique. And here is the radius of the planet uh, derived from the occultation, uh, from the transit method. <coughs> so if you believe what I just said about the, uh, the mass radius curve, um, all giant planets basically should be here with a radius equal to Jupiter's radius. It's 70,000 kilometers in radius. And some are. But the big surprise in the last 10 years is that many are not. So there are many larger objects which are actually much less dense. Many of them are much less dense than one, even, in CGS units. And so they're very puffed up for some reason. So we don't really know why, but um, the modelers um, assume that there is some extra source of heat that puffs up the planet and keeps it bigger than you would expect from the simple argument I just gave. So there's been a burst of work on understanding the structure of planets. And we have many experts at UCLA in the study of the structure of planets in ESS and elsewhere. And um, uh, people are interested in understanding what these large giant planets mean. They're basically too big for the standard theory, so you have to modify that by changing something in the standard theory. There are also some bodies which are uh, smaller than expected. They're more easy to explain. You just add more junk. You add more dirt, more rock to those planets. So anyway, there's the beginnings of a zoo of planets that we can look at. Now, to save time, I'm going to zip over water. Um, yeah and get to life on other planets. Oh, yeah. So planets are interesting, not least because we live on one. Right? So in the back of our minds, we all have this idea that, well, planets must be really important because we're on one. And I tend to agree with that. So underlying this uh, fascination with planets that uh, many people have is the notion that, well, planets are the abode of life. And so when we're looking for planets, we're really studying possible places where life uh, can exist. <coughs> and that's true. And so we're interested to know where is life in the solar system other than the Earth, and where is life in the universe. And there's several problems. The biggest one is what I call the ant problem. And the ant problem looks like that. The ant problem is that this ant, which was induced to carry in its mandibles a microchip, has no idea that it's carrying the advanced product of a high technology civilization living, co-living with it on a planet hurtling around the sun at 30 kilometers per second. The ant has no way to perceive the thing that it's holding in its mouth. Okay, so we're like that ant. We cannot perceive things very far from our everyday experience. That means that when we talk about the search for life in the universe, we really talk about uh, only the search for life, which is like the life we already know about on the Earth. So we're just basically not set up to perceive things very, very different. That's the function of science, in a way, is to try as much as possible to expand our perception so we can see these, these things which are really all around us all the time. So when people talk about the search for life, they really mean the search for things like us, or things like ants, or bugs, things that we understand. And even worse than that, it's taken, in astronomy, it's taken to an even simpler level. Since life, as we know it, depends on water, the search really boils down to a search for habitable environments, places where water can exist in the liquid form, because we think that uh, liquid water is the solvent for all sorts of chemical reactions that are needed by living systems, as it is for the ones we know about. So that's our very narrow definition of life elsewhere. It's probably much more broad than that, but we can't handle that at the present time. So we already have some evidence that I'll just mention to you, and then I'll finish this talk. We know, <coughs> for example, that Jupiter has a satellite called Europa, whose surface, although it looks kind of brown here, is actually very clean ice. It's water ice, not much dirt mixed in. And measurements of um, the magnetic field of Jupiter sweeping past this satellite uh, from um, an orbiting spacecraft done by, uh, again, by UCLA groups, Margie Kivelson and a bunch of other people, some in this room, 
showed that the distortion of Jupiter's magnetic field caused by the satellite is consistent with a conducting layer in this satellite. And the most plausible explanation of the conducting layer is that it's salty water somewhere beneath the surface. Now, the geology of this object kind of supports that. So these plates uh, look amazingly like high-altitude pictures of ice rafts floating in some northern sea. So the ice uh, sheet is uh, broken by motion in the ocean or wind stress or something. And then the pieces you know, translate with respect to each other and rotate with respect to each other. That's basically what we see on Europa. We don't see impact craters. This is not an ancient surface that's been hit for a long time. It's a fresh surface that's been recently uh, overturned. And so Europa is one place where we might expect to find life. We can't see it on the surface, um, but we might see it if we could dig down. And so here's an artist's extravaganza. Um, here's ice in this crust. It's probably a few kilometers thick or thicker. And the artist, because this is what you can do if you're an artist, is put in you know, a plant, a creeping animal, and some jellyfish-like things floating around in the ocean. Now, it seems ridiculous, but actually, you know, maybe that stuff is there. So people are interested in ways to find out. Maybe we'll find that in our lifetimes. <coughs> Even more strange, uh, there is this satellite of Saturn called Enceladus. Europa was a biggie. Europa is 3,000 kilometers across, bigger than the moon. The Earth, um, the Earth is 12,000 kilometers across. Europa's, um, Enceladus is only 500, so it's a tiny uh, body. And by all accounts, it should be a, a tiny, frozen, boring body. Basically, a, a punching bag for every passing projectile should be plastered with craters. But it doesn't have any craters. Again, the surface is fresh. It's new. And even more strange, at certain places on the surface, we see excess heat coming out from the interior. Uh, and we see even material uh, being launched from Enceladus off into circum-Saturn space. And the composition has been measured by the Cassini spacecraft. It's mostly water. It's 92% water. It's 4 or 5% nitrogen. It's a percent or two of CO2. And then there's methane and ethane and, and uh, acetylene and various hydrocarbons coming out of this thing. And ammonia has been detected or reported as well. So these are goodies, right? These are the kinds of things that you want to see if you want to begin organic chemistry. And again, people are very jumpy and very excited. Maybe this is a place in the solar system, not that far away, where life uh, might thrive, but not in a place where we can easily see it. It's protected from the harsh surface environment, which is basically a vacuum. The surface temperature of this thing is uh, 80 Kelvin or 90 Kelvin or something, uh, whereas the hot stuff below is closer to 200 Kelvin. Um, because we have in our possession uh, pieces of the Moon and pieces of Mars, that were blasted out by impact, traveled across the space between Mars and the Earth, came through the atmosphere, and landed on the surface. And it turns out that, here, so here's one, we even have pieces of the Moon and Mars on the UCLA campus in the ESS building. Amazing. A fantastic number of fragments of Mars have been ejected. So the estimate is uh, 10 to the 10 blocks of Martian crust bigger than a meter have been ejected uh, in the age of the solar system, of which about 5% hit the Earth within a few million years. So that's 500 million meter-sized blocks of Mars coming into the Earth. Pretty amazing. The Moon is an even better source, but we don't think the Moon is particularly good for, for life. So then the question is, given that there's this flux of interplanetary boulders passing between the planets, and maybe more than one planet has life on it, what are the chances of survival? <coughs> so. There, I guess, there, there are three um, things to think about. First of all, launch is going to be nasty. It's launched by impact. So hypervelocity impact into the surface blasts out rocks. You might imagine the rocks would be heated to high temperature, but um, measurements of the SNCC meteorites from Mars, for instance, show that's not the case. They're not even shocked. Um, and even when um, rocks pass through the atmosphere of the Earth, we know the heating is confined to a very thin surface skin. Uh, because the heating time is just measured in seconds, so the heat can't uh, diffuse in very far. It's just millimeters. So um, heat effects are probably not important, except on the surface of one of these interplanetary boulders. You might wonder about um, acceleration. 
you know, is the, is the shock that you feel from being ejected from a planet uh, significant? It's a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of times the Earth's gravity. That sounds terrible. But if I drop this pen, that's about a thousand Gs right there on, on the pen. That's not going to kill any bacteria. They're happy with that. Really, that's an enormous acceleration. So acceleration is not a killer either. Launch and arrival are kind of symmetric. There's this question of what can survive the journey, because the radiation and temperature and gas pressure environment um, in interplanetary space is rather harsh. <coughs> so we know something about that too. We know that from people who tried to um, irradiate cans of baked beans uh, to kill bacteria in, in those cans, we know that there are certain bacteria. This one is called radiodurans. They're extremely resistant to energizing particles. So radiodurans, Conan the bacterium it's called, um, are very radiation hardy. They can take, they're unaffected by a thousand grays. Okay, and a gray is a unit of um, en energy deposition in a, in a material. A chest x-ray is about a milligray. So these guys can take a million chest x-rays and they don't even blink. And a million chest x-rays corresponds to something like 100,000 years drifting around the sun between Mars and Jupiter. And if you buried um, radiodurans in a rock, a meter in radius, it could survive for, you know, a hundred times longer or a thousand times longer because the rock acts as a shield um, from the ionizing particles, from the uh, cosmic rays and the solar wind and so on. So surviving radiation is probably not a big deal um, if the bacteria are protected by a rock layer. And then here's my favorite space experiment of all time, something that I just found um, a, a year ago, two years ago. People have done an experiment that I would love to do. They take, uh, I call it, lich okay, when I grew up you know, in England, li lichen was what we said. Um, working class people in England called it lichen, and then middle class people called it lichen. So I, I don't know what you call it, but I still call it lichen. Um, li lichen, <laughs> these are just bits of moss, basically. Uh, attached to a platform, which was sent into orbit around the Earth, exposed to the full vacuum, the full solar UV environment, the full ionizing radiation environment, the absolute absence of pressure, the absolute absence of water, and then brought back down and surveyed to see if they survived. And there's the result. The green bits, um, which are actually most of the picture, uh, survived. So you can do that. You can take moss, put it in space, a place where it was never supposed to survive, and it survives for a long time. So the evidence is that you know, organisms living in the benign environment of the Earth can take a savage beating in, uh, inter in interplanetary space. Maybe the chances for interplanetary transport of bacteria are pretty good. OK, so how do you spot a habitable planet? We don't really know. Here's a measurement from Carolyn Crow, a new graduate student in um, ESS. These are basically the colors of the planets measured from a spacecraft uh, going out to a comet. And the Earth stands out, basically because it's blue. <coughs> but it's not clear that the Earth has to be blue, and it's not clear that every habitable planet has to be blue. But still, we can hope that habitable planets are like, like that one. The other part of the figure is so faint. I don't know if you can turn the lights down uh, one more time. It's so faint, but the faintness is the point of the figure, actually. So in the background is a picture of the Earth taken from 40 astronomical units from the Voyager spacecraft. And you can't see it, even with that circle. Well, I can just about see it, but it's there. The point is that it's really, really faint. And so when we see Earth-like planets around other stars, they'll be like that or worse. And probably all we can do is measure the broadband colors. They'll be so faint, we won't be able to do much more than put them on a diagram like this. What we'd like to do is measure their spectrum and look for biomarkers. And so people are interested in what are the appropriate biomarkers. Ozone is probably one. Ozone produced by, um, by, uh, produced as oxygen by life and then um, uh, formed in the stratosphere by chemical reaction. Methane has been suggested, uh, the chlorophyll edge uh, has been suggested. None of these uh, are, is unique, but I think together you could make a pretty good case if you saw these things on some extraterrestrial planet that uh, life was uh, responsible for them. 
So the questions are, <coughs> in my mind, um, how common are orderly planetary systems like our own? Because the disorderly ones, where the giant planets interacted strongly and e ejected each other, probably decimated those planetary systems. So we still don't know the answer because of these massive biases built into our surveys of extrasolar planets. But we will know uh, fairly soon. When will Earth-sized planets be discovered? Um, they might already have been discovered by Kepler, the spacecraft which has been working now for a year, nearly a year. Uh, and an announcement is planned in February. So look out for that. It's a pretty good bet that they'll say, yep, we found some Earth-sized planets around nearby stars. When will Earth-sized planets be discovered um, in the habitable zones of their stars? That is, in places where surface water could exist as a liquid. Uh, nobody knows, but I'm guessing it won't be many years away. Five years, something like that. When will biomarkers be found? Nobody has any idea, but I'm guessing, to be optimistic, uh, for the young people in the room, a few decades uh, to do this. And then another question that's quite interesting is, which will be discovered first? Some extraterrestrial uh, bugs uh, found by the techniques we were just talking about, or the other end of the spectrum, intelligent life things that can communicate with us by their own will. And so there's a SETI program going on to address that. And I don't know what's going to happen first. There are many people who have their bets on this one, actually, that we'll detect signals from advanced life before we detect uh, pond scum in some planet around a distant star. So once we do this, the next question is, can we go there? The answer now is no, because it takes too long. But we'll figure out technology to do that. And then what? I don't know. That's up to you. So the planet field is pretty exciting. In the solar system, everything has changed recently um, because we now don't see the solar system as this static assemblage of planets moving in circles. Boring. We see this much more chaotic and active system in which particles move radially and all sorts of things can be exchanged. Externally, we are beginning to see all sorts of planetary systems around other stars, most of which are not like our one. Uh, and that's causing us to have all sorts of ideas about the uniqueness or non-uniqueness of our system. And so it's really allowing us to view our system um, as one example of, at the moment, uh, many. So we have about 500 planets in places which are not the solar system. So it's quite interesting. Thank you very much. <coughs>